In this episode of Tuning Healthcare, I'm joined by Dana Gelb Safran, who is the Senior Vice President of Value Based Care and Population Health at World Health. Dana is widely regarded as one of the architects of value based care when she designed and launched the Alternative Quality Contract, the AQC, at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. Most recently, Dana was Head of Measurement, Insurance Markets, and Benefit Redesign at Haven the healthcare venture of Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, and JP Morgan Chase. In this episode of Tuning Healthcare, Dana and I discuss the intersection of data and analytics and decision-making. She gives her insights on the AQC and the importance of measurements in value-based care contracts. She outlines what providers need to do to be successful in value-based care. And we discuss what the Biden administration can do to speed up the transformation of the US healthcare system. Join Dana and me as we tune healthcare. Uh, Dana, thank you so much for joining me today. It's an honor to have you with us. Um, I feel like there's so many topics we could cover, but um, why don't we begin, um, if you would, by sharing a little bit about your early life, what inspired you to go into healthcare? Um, Are there sort of any seminal moments as you look back and say, you know, this is, this is why I'm doing the job I'm doing today. Oh, that's a deep question. Uh, so, and, and thank you, Nigel. It's, it's a, it's an honor for me to, to, um, to be here and, and have the chance to have this conversation with you and, and share, share it with your listeners. Uh, so background on me, you know, I, I think I, I was interested in the field of public health before I actually knew that there was a field of public health. Um, and and for some of your younger listeners, that that may seem you know hard to believe because I think for young people today, there's such a great awareness of public health, especially in this time of the pandemic. Um, but in the 1980s, when when I was in college, public health was a kind of um, a stodgy field that you know was concerned about sanitation, and it wasn't kind of the multidisciplinary, or at least not known as the multidisciplinary sort of human rights uh, and um, social good uh, field that I think it is now. But, it, but I somehow always knew that my interest was in the intersection of data and, and, um, and analytics and decision-making. And uh, I, I had done, done some, some um, interesting work in my college years um, on environmental issues around uh, trying to inform policy during a, a semester away um, from college and, and really learned from that the importance of um, policymakers really having good data and, and analytics um, and information um, and how much they, they needed that from um, reliable sources that that could be seen as unbiased. So um, from college, I went to work at um, a now defunct uh, research arm of the government called the Office of Technology Assessment. And it was a formative time uh, because I really, through that, came to understand how exciting it was to um, take science and put it in front of decision makers to try to make the quality of decisions better and also came to really understand that the field of public health was where I wanted to make my career. That's, um, and um, obviously you've had a, an amazing career. Um, um, what do you look back on and gives you the most pride? Oh, well, I think what I'll always feel extremely proud of is the work that I was able to be part of while I was at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. So I went to uh, Blue Cross at the end of 2006 um, on the invitation of Andrew Dreyfus, who um, is now the CEO, has been for many years, but at the time had a, a different role in the company. Um, and Andrew knew that measurement was getting to be really a, an essential um, set of capabilities for health plans, uh, provider performance measurement, and that he wanted to um, have somebody in the company who not only was expert in measurement, but really was expert and at kind of engaging um, the provider community in the value of that measurement, the integrity of the measurement, and um, really cared about the integrity. And so it was an incredible 
privilege and, and a leap of faith uh, for me going from 16 years in academia to this very important role in a business. I think if I had truly understood um, how different the role was that I was moving to and the skills that I would need to be successful at it, I might have been far more intimidated and maybe even been afraid to take the leap. But, um, but I, there I went and, and uh, within a few months of my arriving, um, our then CEO of Blue Cross um, asked for us to begin to develop a, um, a new model of payment for providers. Uh, and I was fortunate to be among a small handful asked to sequester for 10 days to come up with this new model of payment. And the idea was it should be voluntary. Um, so only provider organizations who shared our vision that we could do better in healthcare uh, would come into this model. And it should do two important things. It should improve quality and outcomes while slowing spending growth. So those two minor things that are really the holy grail and that now we know as the triple aim, but I guess we were lumpers, not splitters. And so we called that our twin goals. And what we came up with um, was the alternative. Let me spit it one more time. We, we made it as the triple aim plus one, but anyway, that's a separate conversation. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're even more splitters. <laughs> um, so what we came up with um, was the alternative quality contract or AQC. We often joked that had we known the AQC would become so well known and influential, we would have sent it to our marketing department before starting to talk about it outside the building. Uh, but in any case, um, being part of both the development of the AQC and then the, um, the management of its success uh, was really one of the um, the high points of my career to date and something I feel very, very proud of. It, it catalyzed payment reform in the country, helped uh, spawn Medicare, ACO movement and, and payment reform in Medicare and private sector. Um, and and uh, that was not just because the model itself is so good, though it is, but also because uh, we had the foresight to um, create a collaboration with Michael Chernu and uh, his team at Harvard Medical School to study what we were doing in a rigorous way while we were doing it. And so all the while, even in the first year, there were publications showing that we were in fact improving quality and outcomes and slowing the rate of cost growth. And that I think that um, peer reviewed evidence base is, is why the AQC has been so influential. Yeah, to say that the AQC is well known is a, is a little bit of an understatement. Um, it is, uh, you know, I think to those of us in value-based care, it's almost seen as the, um, you know, the first major step. Um, it is, it's almost the, the you know, the, the founding father, if you like, of of, uh, of value-based care in a, in a real way. And so um, it's... Uh, it's a truly amazing accomplishment um, that obviously you should be very proud of. Um, but what's um, one of the things that I find fascinating is obviously, obviously those of us that have spent you know so much time looking at researching different models of value-based care and what works and what doesn't work. But one of the things that that I thought was was fascinating, and correct me if I'm wrong, perhaps and definitely a scale, the first time that it was that I think it was done was where you really sort of combined to, 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 uh, to have responsibility for sort of total cost of care where you didn't separate out, you know, physicians versus facilities versus, right. And you sort of said, you know, you have to have responsibility for total cost of care. I mean, I don't know how many times we've had physicians that say, you know, well, can you carve out drugs? And I'm like, carve out drugs. Like, you know how much of an impact that has on, on the health care of your patients, right? Whether they simply just take their drugs or not, right? And so it seems to me that you, um, um, you started that. Um, and you, in a, people had, had theorized about it, but you put it into practice, which is a whole different ballgame, as we know. Theory to execution is, is, uh, is night and day. So um, what was the, what was, tell us, was that, what was the brainchild for, for, for sort of crossing that chasm? Mm. Well, you know, I, I would say, Nigel, that 
we, we can't take credit for the idea of global budgets, but what we maybe can, because you know the, the 1990s course had been filled and maybe we could say littered <laughs> with examples of what then we freely called capitation uh, and that name rarely gets used anymore because it, it has such bad associations with it. But that was in effect global budget contracting. What I think there were many methodological uh, flaws, I think, of the capitated models uh, and the ways that they were executed at that time. But one of the, the biggest pieces that was lacking and that the AQC added and, and where I think we were really novel uh, was that we, by, by 2000, uh, the early 2000s, when we were doing this, the field of quality measurement had advanced sufficiently that we could create a robust set of quality outcome and patient experience measures that were a very effective way to serve as a backstop against any impulse to stint on care that might arise from a global budget. And so that counterbalance, I think, was very, very important. Uh, we had, I think, in our, in our earliest contracts, which launched in 2009, um, 64 uh, measures that covered ambulatory and hospital care, and within each of those settings covered process of care outcomes and patient experience, um, and, and a very, very significant earning opportunity on that set of quality measures. Um, and, and because of that, I think there, the, that really was one of the real differentiators of the AQC. Um, and, and the other thing I'll say that probably was a differentiator is all different ways, as we now know, to set that budget, to set benchmarks against that budget. And one of the things that we did that I think was very important and influential in, in both the early adoption by providers who were willing to come into the model, but then the success, was to say that that budget is based on the historic spending uh, for the population that is attributed to that provider. Um, and the reason that's so important is, you know, there, there have been, you know, so many things written to say up to a third of what we spend on healthcare uh, isn't providing value, could be considered waste. Uh, so we could have easily taken that budget and said, you know, here's the budget and we'll take 2% off, just 2%, not, you know, not a third, 2% off as your starting budget. But what we knew was, number one, if we did that, uh, we'd probably still be waiting today for the first providers who were willing to sign up. But second, there would be enormous public mistrust, because I think we have to reckon with the fact that in the U.S., we do still have a culture that for the most part believes more is better when it comes to healthcare. Maybe that's changing. Uh, maybe the pandemic is gonna contribute to it changing. But fundamentally, I think most people fear getting too little care, not getting too much. And so a, a, a model where patients might know that you know, the budget was set lower than, you know, and that a provider system had less to work with financially than they had previously, I think would have made people nervous. So those two things, having a really robust set of quality outcome and patient experience measures and setting budgets at an amount that everybody understood had waste in it. And then saying, you're accountable to help find that waste and remove it. And you will share in the savings if you do. And if you overspend that budget, you will share in the deficits. I think what were, were some of the differentiators of what we did. Yeah. So, um, Let's talk about measurement of value-based contracts, because um, clearly an area where you've uh, given a lot of thought, and and to me that was the, you know, the the pioneering thing in many ways of AQC, um, uh, because as you said, we had, obviously we'd had global budgets and and people who had lost their shirts on it, but um, it was that balance I think that that you managed to strike. Um, what are sort of the fundamentals for so for those people that are that are thinking about getting into value-based contracts, have a small percentage today of their, of their lives in value-based agreements, but are you know, still predominantly a fee-for-service uh, operation. What are some of the fundamentals that, that you think are critical in a, in a sort of a fair, balanced, value-based care contract? Uh, in the contract, I, I thought you were gonna go somewhere else. I thought you were gonna say, you know, what, what should those provider systems 
feel are, are the critical things they need to do to be successful in the contract. So sure, what what uh, you can you can answer that as well. Take take <laughs> yeah, okay. sure you can take both. Yeah. So so I'll start with the the um, what do providers uh, really need? What what we saw um, as as markers of success uh, were I think four different strategies that providers used and had to attend to to be successful in the model. And I'm using the word you know providers to refer to organizations. Um, for individuals, I refer to them as clinicians. So when I'm saying providers, I mean an, an entity, I mean an organization. And recognizing that we had both physician-based ACOs in the alternative quality contract and hospital-based, we had both. And you know, if we get time, we can talk a little bit about observations, hours, and then those in the literature about differences there. But I really saw um, four, four things that organizations did to be successful. One was they understood that they needed new staffing models to be successful. And we saw you know, provider organizations bringing in social workers um, much more in the way of um, nursing and, and um, sort of care management staff, uh, bringing in pharmacists onto the team. Um, and really building out a team approach to care um, that allowed for um, them to do what global budget contracts demand um, that is truly different from fee-for-service contracts. And that is to think about and care for the patient when they're not in front of you, right? That is just a fundamental difference that when you're being paid based on the totality of care and outcomes as opposed to the units of service for the person who's in front of you, then you have to begin to think about that human being when they're not in front of you, what, what the uh, challenges and barriers are to uh, their being able to manage a chronic condition, avoid uh, the onset of a chronic condition and so forth. Um, so new staffing models were one really essential ingredient. And paired with that were new models of engaging patients, right? So those two things I think were really critical. Um, then there was a recognition that uses of data and information systems were absolutely essential to success in these models, right? You had to really be um, looking at your population, understanding both the population level and the individual level of how you were performing. And, um, and you know, one of the things that I think was another differentiator of the AQC that we haven't spoken about was our support model. Um, and where we work directly with provider organizations that came in to give them data and analytics, provide insights about where were the opportunities for savings, where were the opportunities to improve quality and outcomes. Um, so the, the data and data management part of, um, of success, I think, really can't be um, overstated. And then um, finally, these organizations had to pay more attention to the, the intersection between, um, between and among providers, whether within their system or outside of their system. And um, because again, um, this is one of the, the differences when you're now accountable for the patient regardless of where they are, not just for the encounter, then you really have to be thinking about the, the ways that your patients in your population might fall through the cracks and you have to try to um, create some, some infrastructure so there aren't such cracks. Uh, and, and that's a profound difference uh, to care delivery that really is required, uh, requires attention to be successful in these, these kinds of contracts. So, um, you know, 15 odd years later, uh, we're still struggling. Um, why is that? I mean, it seems it to, to, to you and me, it seems so straightforward, right? The things you need to do, the value, we can put any number of, of um, examples in front of, in front of um, physicians, health systems, payers that show that quality is better, um, efficiency is better, you know, so it's better costs. We haven't, if anything, we've, we've improved quality, not, not sacrificed it, but yet we, we still struggle and the fee for service system remains like a drug that, that we can't, we can't get out, we can't get out of. 
why do you think that is and, and how mm -hmm. do we change it? Yeah, so I think I'll, I'll point to, to three factors. Uh, I'll point to payment and incentives. I'll point to um, data and information and then culture. So on payment and incentives, the reality is that even with the progress that we've made on um, a very large share of provider organizations having some number of accountability contracts, um, that still a very large share of revenue is coming from fee for service. And in particular, you know, because we've seen the kind of shifts in the way healthcare is organized, where now, you know, I, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but a very, very large share of physicians and especially specialists are now um, part of hospital systems. Um, we, hospitals really begin to be, and, and multi-hospital multi uh, organizations begin to be kind of the, the center of, of healthcare delivery and, and organization. And these payment models, even though they have created accountability for total cost of care, um, haven't fundamentally changed the incentives for hospital systems. Um, you know, when you are a primary care physician group, there is a lot that you can do that's downstream from you to manage total cost of care that helps you win in a model that's managing total cost of care um, without hurting your own revenue in any way. Um, but when you are the hospital system, so much of the, the revenue that is is sustaining your organization um, really comes from the delivery of those expensive, complex um, episodes of care um, that the, the idea of cost sharing isn't really sufficient to overcome the, the loss of revenue that comes from doing fewer things. Uh, so, uh, you know, as I was um, transitioning out from Blue Cross, one of the things that, that we were beginning to experiment with was new payment models for hospitals. And, you know, in, in Maryland, there's the um, global budget model yeah, for hospitals. Yeah. And, um, and you could think of what, what we were doing as global budget models for physician organizations, even though it included hospital long-term care, uh, uh, the whole of it. Um, and, and I really felt that if you bring these two together and actually fundamentally change the way hospitals are paid um, and have a budget constraint, um, then you might actually begin to, to work away at what still remain to be um, incentives that are largely fee-for-service driven for some parts of, of the delivery system. Um, so so payment, payment and incentives, I think, is, is one reason that we haven't made more progress. A second reason that we haven't made more progress is um, data and, and the information that we have. And what I mean there is um, we still fundamentally have a measure set as a country that is very, very process oriented, right? Our quality measures grew out of a generation of wanting to measure quality and having fee for service payment. So we measured things that were done. We measured you know, the extent to which the things that were done were in, in uh, line with what guidelines would tell us should be done. Um, and that leads to number one, a, a huge outcry that we hear from providers who say, you know, there's too many measures, right? Because if you're gonna measure everything that's getting done, and if you're now accountable for the total cost of care and everything that gets done, boy, that's a lot to measure. Whereas if we're measuring the outcomes of that care, what we called in some work I was um, uh, involved with uh, for the um, Healthcare Payment Learning and Action Network or the LAN, um, big dot measures, right? The, the big dot measures, you're measuring the outcomes. Now you can actually be parsimonious with your measurement. But unfortunately, we, even though there has been consensus for quite a long time now that we need to move toward more outcomes-oriented measures uh, to pair them with our, our value-based payment, 
we're still very um, early in that and very uh, much reliant still on process measures. And I would say the lack of visibility into the outcomes that we're creating in healthcare is part of what holds us back from actually fully um, realizing the potential of value-based payment because neither can we hold accountability for outcomes because we don't have the appropriate measures, nor can we for providers manage to those outcomes because we, we don't have the measures. Uh, so, so that's, I think, a, a real second challenge. And then the third is cultural, that you know, um, when you start to incentivize and measure um, new things, it fundamentally changes the job of the human beings who are responsible for healthcare. And you know, if, if you or I were told uh, that we were gonna um, still do our same job, but be measured in very different ways, we would have to think about how to do our job differently to achieve those. And, and that's hard, you know, that, that kind of change in, um, first of all, just the, the mental change to believe that what you were doing or how you were doing it before needs changing um, is something that many human beings uh, will rightly resist. Um, and then the actual ability to change it, um, and not just as an individual, but as a whole team, as a whole organization, is not a, a trivial undertaking. So those three things, just those trivial three things, how we pay for care, how we measure it, and, and our culture around you know, uh, how we do our jobs, I think, are, um, make it very hard. But I, do, I am optimistic that uh, we will get there. Yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic too. And at least what we're seeing in the market is that um, a phrase I've, I've used before, right, which is the um, healthcare industry was recession proof, but not pandemic proof. And um, the reaction that we're seeing from a number of health systems is that um, actually I need to speed up my move to, to value-based agreements because that will uh, protect me better um, as I, as we, as we sort of move forward into the next, um, next iteration of what, what healthcare looks like. Um, I'd love to, to touch briefly on, on your time at Haven, right? So Haven is, uh, um, you know, when you went to Haven, perhaps the, the most sought after job in, in, in healthcare, right? The, um, uh, to go to, to work on, on, on everything that was going on there. And so tell us a little bit about that experience and, um, and, and what you did at Haven. Yeah, sure. So, you know, before Haven was announced, I had begun thinking about the fact that I wanted my next chapter after Blue Cross to be something on the purchaser side of the table. And that was because I, I had grown enormously frustrated with the fact that purchasers represent, you know, a, a very, very large share of healthcare spending. And yet, in my experience, we're not having influence on the demand for value that was proportional to that level of, of spending. And so I, I felt really um, compelled to sit on the purchaser side of the table and help demand more value out of the, out of the system. Um, but I knew I couldn't you know, do that working with one one purchaser or two, and um, and so I was I was kind of in search of what what is a good um, platform from from which to do this work, and then Haven got announced, and it was clear you know that that seemed like it was the thing, and um, so it was a thrilling uh, venture, right? And to I started in in January of 2019. I think I was um, employee hire number nine uh, for, for Haven. And, um, and the energy and the excitement over you know, what was in front of us was, was really thrilling. Um, and you know, I like to say that, that I, I hadn't worked in a startup since I had been in academia, but in a lot of ways, starting your own academic um, lab is, is being in a startup. So, so um, the intensity from that perspective felt familiar. I, I walked in the door at Haven with the job of uh, head of measurement. And then um, within the first week also acquired the, the job of leading our work on insurance markets and benefit redesign. Um, and, you know, I think some of the most um, 
meaningful experiences I had while I was at Haven were the experiences of being out on the road uh, back when we could still travel and do so freely, meeting with the employees of these three uh, founding organizations, Amazon, JP Morgan Chase, and Berkshire Hathaway, and talking with frontline workers about what their pain points are in healthcare. And almost inevitably, what it would come down to when we asked the biggest pain points um, had to do with cost, but not just that costs are high, but that costs are so unpredictable. And uh, so what we were working on at the time, and this is one of the, the few Haven initiatives that is you know, um, out in the public, publicly known, so, so it's, it's all right for me to, to share that we were doing this, was some benefit redesign work to say, how can we help uh, in an era where health plans uh, or at least commercial health plans are largely you know, high deductible plans um, where employees find it incredibly difficult to know what their costs will be, how can we actually make benefits easier to understand and use? And um, so by being out there talking with employees and understanding what their experiences were, um, it really helped inform that work. And, um, and now each of the organizations, you know, is underway with some of that benefit redesign work. And, and uh, with my measurement hat on, I was in the process of evaluating what the results were. And so we'll, we'll see when a little more time goes by. Of course, COVID has, um, has been a major confounder uh, in, in the opportunity to evaluate new benefit designs because the ways people are using care changed radically and not just because you know, they had a different uh, set of financial incentives in front of them. Um, so, so it was, it was a, a tremendously exciting uh, place to be and a, a marvelous, marvelous team uh, to be doing the work with. And I really got um, the bug for, for the startup world, right? Being in, a, in an environment where there's so much energy and you're trying to do something new and you know it's hard and you need to prove it. Um, in a lot of ways, that was like my academic days. Um, and I loved that. So it's why I find myself now in another startup uh, where I uh, began uh, last month um, leading the work at, at Well Health Inc. on uh, value-based care and population health. Yeah, that so sounds incredibly exciting. Tell us a little bit about um, the mission at Well Health. Yeah, so uh, Well is a, a five-year-old company um, and it's a communications solution company. Really the, the, um, the vision of our founder and CEO, um, whose name is Guillaume de Zwerich, um, is to make healthcare the number one consumer experience of all industries. So you might say that's an audacious uh, goal and, and I would agree. Um, it comes out of um, Guy's own experiences with the healthcare system, which you know he describes regularly when he talks about his, um, his motivation for founding this company. But as a very young man, uh, which he still is, uh, he had a serious health issue and, and really had to be up close and personal with um, the healthcare system and found it to be, uh, despite wonderful doctors and wonderful hospitals, as he says, just a terrible experience because of the fragmentation and, and um, difficulties. And, and so uh, Well Health seeks to, to be that last mile communication uh, platform for providers and patients. And, and now in the work that I'm doing, also between health plans and patients and ACOs and patients. Because, you know, Nigel, you and I both know there are so many organizations right now doing some really wonderful innovation to try to get to better outcomes, get to more affordable care. And one of the biggest impediments is actually reaching the patient, actually getting to, to engage the patient, motivate the patient um, and help continue to support the patient. And so a tool that is enabling all that wonderful innovation to be more successful is really something I feel very proud to be part of. And I think uh, back to our earlier uh, part of this conversation will be one of the things to help make ACOs more successful. 
And that's part of why I'm so excited to be be part of the, the WELL uh, leadership team is that I do think that by helping to enable success with the patient engagement, we will help ACOs be more successful and therefore help payment reform be more sustainable um, and scalable. And um, that's something I, I continue to care passionately about. The, the number of uh, organizations that are in healthcare now um, trying to help figure out a part of the solution is, is absolutely stunning. And so, you know, I'm with you. I hope that um, obviously hope well successful and, and from a sort of global healthcare, US healthcare perspective, hope that um, so many of these organizations help, help us solve some of these problems that you identified, right, which are, which are not easy to solve um, as, as you so, so well articulated. Um, so we're about to transition to a, uh, to a Biden administration. Uh, given your background in public policy, um, what would you like to see from, from, a, from a new administration that would help solve some of these problems? So if you, I've always felt that, um, that some of the best solutions come from sort of public-private partnership. Um, so what would you like to see from a new administration to help solve some of these problems that, that we continue to face in healthcare? Hmm. Well, uh, I'd say number one would be a firm commitment to um, the strong implementation of the ACA um, and the continued implementation of the ACA, you know, to have over 20 million Americans uh, who have coverage who didn't have it um, before is, is no small success. And uh, we need to, to really uh, be sure that, that we don't lose that. Um, we also need to recognize that the ACA has, has not um, solved the cost problem. And, and you know, like, like the model that the ACA drew from, which was Massachusetts uh, coverage reform, you know, in Massachusetts, the reason I didn't share this when I was talking about the AQC, but the reason the AQC was born was we knew that our coverage reform law in Massachusetts would um, do great things to get to universal coverage, but that now we had to solve the cost issue after that, right? And, and so um, the ACA really did take us um, a good distance uh, with starting payment reform, uh, as we've been talking about over this hour, but we have so much more to do. So I'd like to see the Biden administration doubling down on the efforts around uh, payment reform. I'd like to see some greater parsimony in the number of payment models that are out there so that we can truly be learning what's working, so that we can send stronger signals to the provider organizations that we are in fact progressing away from fee-for-service, uh, but that it's not a dizzying array of, of different models and choose the flavor you like. Uh, but that there is a kind of systematic way that we're going to progress uh, from fee-for-service system to a, um, a system that requires accountability for the total cost of care for populations. Um, so those two things I think are critical. And then um, I'd, I'd name two, two more. One is um, the, the infrastructure for measurement really has to improve, right? So that second piece I talked about with respect to the barriers to making more progress on, on payment reform is our, our data and, and information. In order to move toward more value-based care, we have to have a better uh, set of measures around outcomes. And to have that set of measures around outcomes, we have to have better data capture. And um, so public-private partnerships around the data capture and around the um, really accelerated development and validation of of big dot outcomes-based measures that can help us um, to manage for results, not just deliver services in healthcare is critical. And then the, the um, final piece I would say is that the pandemic has really shown us that we have to think more broadly uh, about public health. And in that I'll include social determinants of health. Uh, and we can't continue on thinking that the healthcare delivery system and the public health sector are separate things that you know work in parallel. They have to work in, in conjunction with one another. And so really developing um, policies and, and practices that, that enable that, I think is, is a, another important priority for the Biden administration. Yeah, I couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. Um, the, uh, 
the lesson, if you like, of the many lessons, obviously, from the pandemic, but the separation of, of health from public health to sort of what you want to call commercial health, for want of a better word, is um, is clearly shown to, to to have failings as we've uh, as we've experienced the last year. Um, you know, one one quick topic I have to hit on before we before we wrap here is I was reading your Well Health bio, and there were two things that um, that struck out to me. The first is is um, a passion for adventures. Um, what does that What does that mean? Um, a passion for adventures. Sorry, I was just letting my uh, next meeting know that I'm running a few minutes late and that they should start. A passion for adventures. Well, so so um, you know, I I love travel. Um, I have since since I was young, really been been somebody who. Um, likes to to be experiencing new things um, on a very regular basis, right? So I never liked uh, and still don't like to go back someplace on vacation that I've been before. Um, I like to just keep experiencing new places. Um, and of course, you know, you, you can at least at at, um, at the stage of life that I'm at be traveling all the time. I, I do have to, you know, earn a living as well. And so how do I, how do I, have adventure, you know, on my day to day life, spending as much time as I can, you know, outdoors. Um, my husband and I love cycling. We love, you know, taking uh, long cycling trips on the weekends. I'm somebody who has always, you know, the worse the weather, the more I love to be outside. Um, and uh, so, you know, running and cycling and, and hiking, uh, being outside with my dog, who's always a good excuse, uh, even during COVID or maybe especially during COVID uh, for, for being out in the woods. Um, so, so that's what I mean. And, um, and then the other thing that struck out of the, uh, on your bio was, uh, was mixology. So if we were to post COVID be invited around for, uh, for a cocktail party, what would be the, what would be the drink of choice that we should expect? Oh goodness. Well, I think it would depend on the time of year really. So having just come through Thanksgiving, we were uh, into um, apple cider mules, right? So things that have some some apple, some spice, and and uh, mules. But you know, we we change it up. We uh, actually one of our our uh, favorite restaurants uh, in our town, where we took um, lessons from a phenomenal bartender, um, has been one of the casualties of COVID. So we're really very sad about that, but he has been a good teacher and equipped us with um, infinite, uh, really infinite uh, variations on, on cocktails uh, by giving us a, a recipe book and then how to, how to mix it up uh, to, you, to mix metaphors there. Um, so, so yeah, we, we do enjoy being creative um, with the cocktails. Yeah, and um, you know, it's so hard not to miss the the human side right of this past year right whether it be people's health or, or people's businesses it's um it's really incredibly tough um so i'd like to end with um what i call the quick fire round um just your your quick thoughts on 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 a couple of questions um best piece of advice you were ever given ah uh, um give credit to others that's, uh, yeah. that's a good yeah. yeah, I think it was Nelson Mandela said, said, lead from, lead, lead from the front, but let other people believe you're leading from the back, um, which <laughs> is sort of the same, something similar. I, I probably butchered the quote a little bit, but something very similar. Um, uh, what do you do to relax, have fun? I think we've covered that, right? Yeah, yeah so. that's it. Yeah, uh, but because I probably gave you too much detail on that other one, I'll say it short and sweet here so you can use it. Um, just love to love to be outside. Love to uh, be on my bicycle, be in the woods, hiking, cycling, um, traveling when that's possible. Uh, that's that's fun. And now, actually, really love cooking. And if you could change one thing about healthcare, what would it be? Oh, we'd be managing toward results uh, and outcomes. We'd have great measures of outcomes and, and be paying based on, on value and outcomes, not based on individual units of service. 
Dana, thank you so much for, for joining me today. You know, there's so many things as I think back over this conversation that you've said that are insightful, but if there's one quote that, that really sticks with me, it's um, uh, to think about and care for a patient when they're not in front of you, right? And if that is, um, you know, one thing that, that we can take away as, as healthcare executives as something to ensure that we're we're further ahead on next year than we are this year that will that will make 2021 a successful year so my best wishes to you and your family for the holidays and thank you so much for joining us today thank you so much for the opportunity Be well. thank you for joining us today please follow us on your favorite streamer and don't forget to rate us as it helps others find our podcast as we approach the holidays I wish you and your family a happy and healthy holidays and a successful 2021. And please join us next time as we tune healthcare. This is Nigel Orenstein in New York.